Welcome back to Perkei Vot and the teachings of Yeshua. In this, the fifth video of the series, we'll take a look at some connections between Perkei Vot and the Apostolic Scriptures from Chapter 4 of Perkei Vot. Once again, the goal of this study is not to cover every Mishnah of each chapter, but to pull a few Mishnayot from each chapter and show the connections between Perkei Vot and the Apostolic Scriptures, particularly the teachings of Yeshua. And if you'd like to read the entire text of Perkei Avot, you can do so using the link below this video. Chapter 4, Mishnah 4 Rabbi Levitas of Yavna used to say, Be exceedingly lowly of spirit, for the hope of man is with worms. Rabbi Levitas taught that a person should be humble and not prideful. Well, what does this mean? First, the scriptures repeatedly warn against arrogance and pride. Here are a few examples. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall, Proverbs 16, 18. One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor, Proverbs 29, 23. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low, Isaiah 2, 12. The Talmud expands on this by saying, Concerning any person who has arrogance within him, the Holy One, blessed be he, said, He and I cannot dwell together in the same world. As it is stated, He who slanders his neighbor in secret, him will I destroy. He who is haughty of eye and proud of heart, him will I not suffer. Quoting Psalm 101 verses 5 and 6. But Rabbi Levitas does not just say that a person should be humble. He says that a person should be exceedingly lowly of spirit. Why does a person need to be exceedingly humble? For our answer, we need to turn to Rabbi Moshe bin Maimon, otherwise known as Rambam. When it comes to character traits, Rambam almost unconditionally says that a person should not sway to one extreme or another, but to take what he calls the middle path. For instance, a person should not be miserly when it comes to tzedakah, but neither should he give away the farm, so to speak. On this particular character trait of humility, however, he seems to differ. His commentary on this Mishnah is extensive. After he gives a long discourse expounding on this Mishnah from various sources for how pride is one of the worst possible sins, he quotes the sages saying that if a man's character related to pride and humility was divided into 64 parts, then 63 of those parts should be humility and only one should be pride. Rambam concludes his understanding of Rabbi Levitas' teaching by saying a person should force himself to completely distance himself from pride by thinking of the end of the body, and that is its return to worms. It appears that Rambam agrees with Rabbi Levitas and approves of this particular extreme. Why? Because pride is fertile soil for the cultivation of all sorts of sinful behavior, and those who desire to draw near to Hashem need to plow up that field until there are no traces of the weeds of pride. Yeshua taught extensively on the topic of pride and humility as well. In Matthew 5, 5, he taught his disciples, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. One of the main ways he taught on this topic was through parables. In Luke 14, we read, Now he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is Luke 14, 7 through 11. He also used the catalysts of daily events to prompt a teaching on the topic. At that time, the disciples came to Yeshua saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This is Matthew 18, 1 through 4. Both Rabbi Levitas and Rabbi Yeshua agree. If a person claims to fear God, he should run in the opposite direction of pride. Rabbi Yochanan bin Baroka said, Whoever profanes the name of heaven in secret will pay the penalty in public. Whether it be done accidentally or intentionally, both are equal regarding the desecration of the name. In this Mishnah, Rabbi Yochanan bin Baroka tells us that whoever desecrates God's name, whether in public or private, is liable to divine punishment. But what does it mean to desecrate God's name? Is he referring to a specific word or phrase that we might say? No. As I've mentioned many times previously in other teachings, Desecration of God's name, Chilul Hashem in Hebrew, is primarily when we do things that dishonor God in front of others. An act of public desecration of God's name would be something like talking to a customer about how spiritual you are and then swindling him into buying something that wasn't worth the price tag. To desecrate God's name in private would be to preach against pornography in public while watching it in private. In one word, this is hypocrisy. Yeshua had absolutely no tolerance for this. In Matthew 23, he chastised the leaders of his day by saying, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter go in. Matthew 23, 13. When Yeshua speaks of the scribes and Pharisees, he's speaking of a group of people who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders and role models in Israel, but yet held onto hidden sins. Yeshua said, Do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. Matthew 23, 3. Yeshua told his disciples to obey the teachings of these people, but not to follow in their footsteps. Why? Because they were hypocritical. They publicly played the role of piety while privately living a life that dishonored God by circumnavigating His commandments. They felt that others were required to be scrupulous in their observance of the commandments, while they could find loopholes to get around them. Yeshua told his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Mark 12, 38-40 How would they devour widows' houses? Evidently, there was a popular racket among the elite that swindled the elderly out of selling their homes. Normally, this would not be a problem since property was able to be bought back within a year and ultimately returned in the Yovel, the Jubilee year. However, there was a stipulation in the Torah that allowed a person to maintain possession of a house despite either of these two conditions. In Leviticus, we read, If a man sells a dwelling house in a walled city, he may redeem it within a year of its sale. For a full year he shall have the right of redemption. If it is not redeemed within a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong in perpetuity to the buyer throughout his generations. It shall not be released in the Jubilee. This is Leviticus 25, 29, and 30. Just like the corrupt attorneys use loopholes in the law to keep wealthy and influential criminals from ever going behind bars, so too there are always those who would find loopholes in the Torah for dishonest gain. If a person wanted to steal the home of someone in the days of the Master, all they had to do was find an impoverished individual within a walled city who owned a house. They could then purchase their house. This would be similar to a type of home equity loan that could be paid off at the end of the year. The laws of the Torah for this process were intended to help the homeowner get back on his feet with the money from the purchase and then buy back the house within a year's time. But if he didn't buy the house back within a year's time, then it was assumed he didn't want the property or was not able to get the funds he needed to repay the loan. A person without fear of heaven, however, could take advantage of this system and conveniently disappear when the loan payment was due allowing the terms of repayment to expire and thus maintaining permanent control over the property. This is only one method for which the homes of widows could be potentially swindled out 
from under them. And if there were actually Pharisees taking part in scams like these, we can see why the name of heaven would have been desecrated, why Yeshua would have been filled with holy anger at the situation. In Luke 12, he told his disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetop. Luke 12, 1 through 3. Just like Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka, our Master Yeshua says that anyone who thinks he's getting by with something in secret will ultimately have his sins exposed and pay the consequences thereof. Mishnah number 8. Rabbi Yossi used to say, He who honors the Torah is himself honored by mankind. He who dishonors the Torah shall himself be dishonored by mankind. In his famous teaching from his Sermon on the Mount, Yeshua clearly expresses the Torah's continuing authority in the lives of his followers. He said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Matthew 5, 17 through 18. While many people debate over the meaning of what it means to abolish or fulfill the Torah, most simply skip over the very next statements about those who would uphold or diminish the Torah in the eyes of others. He continues by saying, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 19 and 20. In other words, those who would honor the Torah will himself be honored, and those who would dishonor the Torah would in turn be dishonored, like we read from Rabbi Yossi. Why does Yeshua conclude this section by saying, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven? It only makes sense if he is addressing the hypocrisy we just mentioned in Mishnah number 5. He specifically says, whoever does them and teaches them, referring to the commandments. Again, how do his disciples' righteousness surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees he was referring to? By actually living out the commandments, rather than merely telling others to obey them. Authenticity triumphs hypocrisy in every book. Mishnah number 13. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov used to say, he who performs one commandment acquires for himself one advocate, while he who commits one transgression has gotten for himself one accuser. Repentance and good deeds are as a shield against punishment. For those who grew up in the church, this Mishnah may sound very odd. At first, we may think this sounds very legalistic, a tally on each side for every good deed or bad deed that a person does, right? But if we disconnect this from any context of salvation, then it makes perfect sense. The lesson? We have consequences for our actions. If we plant the seeds of unrighteousness, then we will reap the fruit that we have sown. If we repent and do what is right, however, the seeds of righteousness will take root and bring forth a harvest of righteousness. Yeshua himself teaches his disciples in a way that seems very uncharacteristic in the parable of what is often called the unjust manager. There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. 
The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Luke chapter 16, 1 through 9. In this parable, more appropriately called the shrewd manager, as we will see shortly, this steward is called into account for his bad investments. In order to make things right, he, quote, cooks the books, so to speak, thereby ingratiating himself to his master's debtors. By doing so, he not only secures his future, but he also gains his master's respect. To our Western ears, this sounds scandalous. Not only the actions of the steward, but especially that Yeshua uses this illustration as an example of how his disciples should be acting. Is Yeshua condoning dishonesty here? Absolutely not. His teaching, rightly understood by scholars like Dr. Brad Young and others, is to be understood in relation to what we do with our material possessions in this world. There are many savvy investors who have made money hand over fist throughout their life, but on the day of reckoning, they will be called into account for their investments. Were they wise stewards who invested in eternal dividends? Or did their investments fail once their worldly existence ceased? Yeshua's parable is an urgent plea to those who would trust in worldly investments to roll their investments over to those that would reap eternal rewards, namely giving to the poor. How does this parable relate to the teaching of Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov? Rabbi Eliezer suggests that our deeds create for us either advocates or accusers. Rabbi Yeshua says essentially the same thing. In this example, when one gives tzedakah, those things in our possession that already belong to those in need, a person acquires for himself friends, advocates from unrighteous or worldly wealth in order that they may be received into eternal dwellings. In other words, they create for themselves advocates in the heavenly court, just as Rabbi Eliezer taught. But when a person only uses his worldly wealth for worldly pleasures, then he creates for himself accusers to whom he will one day be accountable in the heavenly court. May we all be like the shrewd manager and use our worldly possessions for eternal rather than temporal investments. Mission of 15, Rabbi Elazar ben Shemua used to say, let the honor of your student be as precious to you as your own, and the honor of your colleague as the respect due your teacher, and the respect towards your teacher as your reverence for heaven. In this mission, Rabbi Elazar calls for respect, respect for teachers, students, and peers alike. In each scenario, he elevates the level of respect thought due to the individual. He first tells teachers to honor their students as they would honor themselves, the students to honor one another as they would their teacher, and for students to honor their teacher as they would if they were in the presence of Hashem himself. In the years after the destruction of the Holy Temple, this was a real problem. According to legend, 24 thousand of Rabbi Akiva's students died in a play because of how they disrespected one another, and the minor holiday of Lag Omer commemorates the end of this plague. The Talmud says that after that, the world was essentially void of Torah until Rabbi Akiva chose his new disciples. Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yose, Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Elazar ben Shemua. Being a direct disciple of Rabbi Akiva and having the realization of how many of his disciples had suffered because of how they treated one another, Rabbi Elazar ben Shemua taught his disciples to respect one another properly. As we know, Yeshua taught his disciples the importance of honor and respect as well. In John 13 we read, Yeshua laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. This is John 13, 4 and 5, 12 through 15. At this moment, during his final meal with his disciples, he not only told his disciples to honor and to serve one another, but he demonstrated what he meant. He humbled himself and washed their feet as a servant rather than their esteemed rabbi. He was the ultimate example of humility. There is one difference between what Rabbi Eleazar taught and what Yeshua taught his disciples. Desiring his disciples to remain humble and esteem others more than themselves, he taught his disciples, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called teachers, for you have one teacher, the Messiah. The greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Matthew 23, 8 through 12. He was not telling his disciples to avoid taking on titles such as rabbi, teacher, and even father. He was telling them to not try and step into the place that he had held among his disciples. Today, there are Hasidic dynasties within Judaism who have a single leader who acts almost as a mediator between those in his sect and God. When a leader passes, a new one is appointed to take his place and fills that void. Not so among the disciples of Yeshua. Once Yeshua ascended to the Father, no one was to take his place. He would still lead his disciples from above, rather than someone attempting to take charge over his sheep. This is what Yeshua meant by this instruction to his disciples. Whereas Rabbi Eleazar taught his disciples to elevate their teachers to an almost deified position, Yeshua taught his disciples to view subsequent teachers that would come after him as a respected peer, not as one who has ultimate authority over them. Although there is a slight difference between the perspective of Rabbi Eleazar and that of Yeshua, they both agree that we should work hard to honor and respect others. Mishnah number 16. Rabbi Yehuda used to say, be meticulous in study for error in study, i.e. a careless misinterpretation, amounts to deliberate sin. What does Rabbi Yehuda mean when he says that an error in study is equal to deliberate sin? We all know that sometimes people study parts of the Bible without paying much attention to detail and without taking the rest of Scripture into account. At other times, people study the Scriptures to prove themselves correct or because of some other personal agenda. Studying the Word of God like this can often produce undesirable results and lead to interpretations that are at odds with the simple meaning of the text. As a matter of fact, any teaching can be completely upended if we're not careful. We have a great example of how the teachings of Antigonus of Soho were misunderstood because of carelessness many years before the days of Yeshua. In chapter 1 of Pirkeva, we have learned that he taught his disciples, do not be as servants who serve their master for the sake of reward, rather be as servants who serve their master, not for the sake of reward. According to tradition, however, two latter generation disciples of Antigonus of Soho, Zedok and Bothus, were the founders of the sects of the Sadducees and the Bothusians. They founded their heretical sects based on a misunderstanding of this seminal teaching of their rabbi. They turned the teaching of their rabbi completely on its head. As we know, the purpose of Antigonus' maxim was to teach his disciples to serve God selflessly and without need for reward. He wanted them to be faithful servants who would fulfill their spiritual service under any circumstance, rather than only when they are rewarded for their service. However, these disciples taught their disciples that there was actually no reward for their actions in this life. In other words, there was no world to come. Since all rewards must be received and enjoyed in this life, hedonism became common practice among the Sadducean sect. Also, a type of social elitism arose to separate the wealthy from the poor, since the wealthy were surely blessed and favored by God, and the poor were only wicked sinners. 
Yeshua continually butted heads against the Sadducees of his day in regard to the concept of the resurrection as well. In Matthew 22, some of the Sadducees came to Yeshua trying to make him look foolish with a Torah question about the resurrection. He rebuked them, saying, You are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. This is Matthew 22, 29. Generally, there are no foolish questions when it comes to Torah learning. However, Yeshua knew that their question was not sincere, but only an attempt to discredit him in public. And because of this, he pointed out their error and didn't waste his time formulating a response they could simply ignore. We can easily see how something similar has happened to the teachings of both Yeshua and Paul, with a large majority of their followers believing that they have somehow set aside the laws of the Torah. Dr. Brad Young points out the problems with such careless interpretations, saying, While few modern Christians would resort to changing the words of their Bible, they interpret the words of Jesus in a way that upholds their understanding of a sharp contrast between law and grace. Prejudiced exegesis can have the same result as altering the canonical text. If we truly believe the Holy Scriptures to be divinely inspired, then we should treat them with the level of respect they deserve and diligently work to properly understand them, especially as disciples. Sure. Mishnah number 19. Rabbi Yanai used to say, It is not in our power to explain the well-being of the wicked or the sorrows of the righteous. The age-old question of good and evil, particularly the question of why do bad things happen to good people, has existed probably since the creation of mankind. Yeshua even addressed it in his day. In Luke 13 we read, There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered, Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is Luke 13, 1 through 5. Yeshua told his disciples that when bad things happen, it doesn't mean someone is a bad person. It just means we are in a broken world, and our job here is to keep ourselves from being tainted by the influences of the world. We should constantly have an attitude of repentance so that our end will not merely be our physical death. Like Rabbi Yanai says, it is not in our power to explain the well-being of the wicked or the sorrows of the righteous. We must simply accept these two immutable truths. First, Hashem runs the world. Second, His love towards us is unending. Everything else in between must be filtered through these two principles. Well, this wraps up our fifth lesson of Perkevo and the teachings of Yeshua. May Hashem continue to give you revelation and insight into His holy word, and may the teachings of our Master Yeshua ever draw you closer to the Father. We'll see you soon in our next lesson. Blessings.